Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome once again to Faith Fellowship Sunday School. I hope you took a little time to look at last week's uh, Sunday School and give some thought to it and even kind of peruse the scriptures to see, like the Bereans, whether these things are so. Understanding the whole idea of the laying on of hands and the dispensations of time and the development of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how it worked its way first from Jerusalem throughout the rest of the world. And how if we miss a point or if we get caught up in a scripture or a belief system without the total totality of scripture, we may end up in error. So Pentecostalism, non-Pentecostalism, gifts of the spirit, no gifts of the spirit, speaking in tongues, no speaking in tongues. All of those things have been debated over the years. And I'm just simply reading to you what the scriptures say that helps us continue to develop our own theology and understanding, not as though it's our own theology alone, but biblical theology that you can confidently go forward in your walk with the Lord and your understanding of the scriptures. So it's an important thing that we do, and I want to just continue it today. So I hope you got a chance to just spend a little time looking at Acts chapter 19. Remember, I'm going to go back there and read just a little to bring us up to speed today. In Acts 19, beginning in verse 1, it says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. It doesn't mean it was bad or in error or wrong. It wasn't the full story. It says, he told the people to believe in the one coming after him, which is totally accurate. And it says, that is Jesus, which is, he is the Messiah. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's what happened. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now they have the full revelation or a more full revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So we're just going to finish that today. I think it's an important enough topic that we spend time on. Now, last week we talked about Peter and John in Acts chapter 8 in Samaria. When they found out the gospel had reached them, they went there and they preached the more full revelation to them, laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit, or they were saved. Now, what that means is, uh, we'll see it again in Acts chapter 10. We read it before, but I just want to fill the, the, the voids, perhaps, if there are any, on what was actually happening at that time, because the world was changing. It's kind of like a brand new message was on the horizon or on the scene. And it wasn't a brand new message. It was the message from the beginning, but the understanding of it was not complete. Remember, in the garden, they were told, Adam and Eve, about this one who was going to come, who was going to be born, the seed of a woman. So the gospel message has been around the whole time. It's just that it wasn't, as we read before, until Matthew chapter 1, when the angel came to Mary and Joseph that we found out the name of this Messiah or the one born, the seed of a woman, the angel told them to give them the name, give him the name Jesus. And at that moment, the world finally understood who this Messiah was by name. But un up until then, he was a wonderful counselor, everlasting father, the Prince of Peace. He was, uh, from uh, the line of David, and he was uh, the one born seed of a woman. All of these biblical names were given to him. The suffering servant of Isaiah 53, he was all these different names, or described in different ways, but in the gospel, the name was finally known. The identity and the name came together, and it was Jesus. Now, that message is now complete. 
and the world now needs to know it. So we're going to pick up again. Turn with me to Acts chapter 10 because we're going to continue this whole idea of how salvation and the full revelation was being brought to the people of the first century church, the first church or the first um, period of the church in its um, genesis and how the story or the fullness developed. So in Acts chapter 10, remember, Peter has received a vision from the Lord to go to this man's house. Uh, Cornelius, he was someone who believed in the Lord and a good man and a, a godly man. And he had all of these attributes that were religious and they were good in nature, but he still had not received the Holy Spirit of God and becoming in becoming a believer. So Peter's now at Cornelius' house in verse 44 of Acts chapter 10. It says, while Peter was speaking, now he's preaching the gospel. Make sure you read back again through the previous verses so that you get a full picture here. Peter is preaching the gospel. And it says, while Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. Remember, Pentecost Jews it says, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And see, that's another one of those instances where the Holy Spirit was received and people began to speak in tongues. So the connection was that there had to be this moment where speaking in tongues became the evidence of you having the Holy Spirit, which that is not the case. That is not the case. When you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you have the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 8, let's go back, or Romans chapter 8, let's go back a few, uh, up a few chapters and then in the book of Romans and see why this is an important understanding. Because if you miss this point, you could find yourself destitute of knowledge and wisdom and revelation of what real salvation is. You have to know that uh, Pentecostalism uh, is a belief system and believing the laying on of hands is how people receive the Holy Spirit. Now, not all Pentecostals. So let me just clarify real quick. Some in the Pentecostal movement believed, unless you spoke in tongues, that you were not a believer. And the proof that you had the Holy Spirit was that you were speaking in tongues. That's not all of Pentecostalism. That's just some of the thoughts of some in the movement. Of course, that is not the case. And I believe that not many believe that, but they did believe that in order to speak in tongues, you needed a second dispensation of the spirit. So in Romans chapter eight, this is important. It's very important. You have to get this. It says in Romans chapter eight, and let's start in verse seven, uh, Romans eight, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. He's talking about the fleshly man or the fact that there are two distinct people on the planet of all the different races and ethnicities. There are really two types of people on the planet, those who have the spirit of God and those who don't. That's really what populates the earth. And those who have the spirit of God are trying to evangelize the rest who do not have the spirit of God. That's the world we live in. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. There is no ability to please God for in righteousness in acts of the flesh. It says, you, however, you are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Now, listen. There is no separate spirit of Christ or separate spirit of God or the Holy Spirit. They're all one. That's our Trinitarian theology. But what he's saying is, if you don't have the spirit of God in you, then you do not belong to God. So what we're saying in, uh, in contrast to some in the Pentecostal movement, if they only can prove they have the spirit of God in them, 
by speaking in tongues. And if they don't speak in tongues, they don't. That means if you follow that line of thinking, and this is not the whole Pentecostal world. In fact, it may be a small portion of the Pentecostal world. But if you do not have the spirit of God in you, then you're not a believer. So it's now it's not a matter of whether or not you speak in tongues. The real issue is, are you saved when you start looking at these things, you know, in depth? And so they're saying some, if you do not speak in tongues, you do not have the spirit of God. And therefore, Paul is saying in Romans 8, if you don't have the spirit of God, you don't even belong to him. Forget the tongues matter. You don't even belong to God. So you see that whole tongues issue was an important deal in the early ages of the church. And it carried on through the period of the gospel spreading around the whole world and finally crossed an ocean into what we now call America. And even here, the final product still had to be put together, but because it wasn't or there wasn't this one belief in what the Bible says in totality, we start to factionalize and believe all kinds of different things. Well, remember I said last time, don't major in the minors. The minors are not important for you. It's the majors that are important. Uh, the minors are those things that are, if you wanna wear a dress to church or pants as a woman, uh, you decide. Has nothing to do with your salvation if you ask me. Uh, whether or not you should have a, a something over your head, uh, wear it or not. It has nothing to do with your salvation. In fact, your salvation is in Christ and Him alone. That's just the fact of the matter. And so, when Paul asked this question, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? What he's really saying is, since you believe in this one who's coming after John the Baptist. Now that he's here, he's lived, he's died, he's been resurrected from the dead and he's seated now at the right hand of God. Now the full message has come together. Now Paul brings that all together. Peter and John brings it all together. And then there's the laying on of hands at the prayer and they receive the Holy Spirit or they truly become full believers. That's what it means. God is good. And God was, uh, he's reconciling the world to himself in this time, but it had to start somewhere. And I guess at the beginning of anything, there is still a lack of knowledge. When you start a new job, you only know what you know when you start the job, but it's in time and understanding of the, the operation and how things go that the more full revelation is now made known to you. So these things are very, very important. And now we're piecing it all together. So we get to our next point here, going back. Well, let me finish this one thing. It says, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even your body, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. Now, even though you are in Christ, the spirit of God lives in you, your body will still die. This flesh will still die. I mean, we see it all the time and we know it's true. It's appointed to man once to die and after that the judgment. The real exception that we believe biblically is the rapture. It's a little different, but you're still not going to carry this flesh into heaven. So that kind of covers that to the point where salvation is in Jesus. The gifts of the Spirit, or another, th they are another thing. And we're going to continue with that. Now, in Stephen's defense, when he was defending the gospel, it says Stephen was full of the Spirit and full of God's grace when he was sharing with all of the people there who were about to stone him to death, which they could not withstand his wisdom, it says, read it. And they were infuriated by the gospel message. They were not embracing it. They were, they were enemies of Stephen's message. And so even though they were using their theology and their thought process, their Ju Judaism against Stephen, they could not withstand his wisdom. 
and they started, they started to grind their teeth. They were so angry and frustrated, and they actually stoned Stephen to death. But see, I believe that there is greater and greater measures of God's power that can work in your life. You know, there are Old Testament uh, pictures and imageries of that where Samson, God's power would come on him and he just became super, super strong. I can't even imagine trying to face a lion down with my bare hands. I'd shoot him, but I can't face him with my bare hands unless the Spirit of God came upon me in great power. But remember, not everybody was walking in that power. Uh, Samson was because that was a special gift that God imparted to him. Now, it seemed to be in his hair, but it was really simply the Spirit of God overshadowing him, overwhelming him with supernatural power. That's what happened. Now, let's continue this line of thinking here uh, in the book of um, uh, 1 Corinthians. And let's start in verse or chapter 14, in 1 Corinthians 14. One of the things that were being addressed in um, the Pentecostal, non-Pentecostal, speaking in tongues, not speaking in tongues world or argument or debate was whether or not you had to have, um, whether or not speaking in tongues was a language or whether or not it was speaking in a foreign language or a heavenly versus a heavenly language. Now in 1 Corinthians 14, let's add a little more to the story. Beginning in verse 1, Paul writes, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. So he puts prophecy at the very top. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Now, think about that for a minute. Um, that's not another foreign language. That is a language in which we speak to God. So now the argument of whether or not speaking in tongues mean you speak in another language, a foreign language you don't understand, Paul is getting ready to kind of shelve that right now. He says, Indeed, no one understands them. Let me read it again. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. No one, who un no one understands them. No one? No one? They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening or their encouragement. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, right? Edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies ed edifies the church. I would love for every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather that you prophesy. So now I want you to understand that he's making a very clear distinction. Now, if it was another language or simply a foreign language that you did not know that you're now speaking in the midst of a congregation of people and no one understood you were not the same race of those people, but now you're going to speak. It would be like me standing in front of a, in a synagogue and all Jewish people. Well, if I start speaking English, they have no idea what I'm saying. But if God gives me a special dispensation and now I can speak in that language or Hebrew, then now it is. God has given me a special gift to speak in a language that's not my own. But he's making a distinction by saying when you speak in another tongue, you're speaking to God. And in that tongue, no one understands you. Humanly understands what you're saying. You're edifying yourself. You're not speaking to man. You're speaking to God. Those are differences. Those are distinct uh, things that are distinct one from another. These things divide the religious world, but the scriptures, in my view, are very clear in what they're saying. He says, I would like every one of you, now I'm reading back again in 1 Corinthians 14, I would like every one of you in verse 5 to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, 
unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. Now, the interpreter is introduced or the person who God enables to understand what that tongue actually meant. That heavenly word that came forth by the spirit that generally goes from man to God, God can enable a man to understand it. And so that's what's happening here. That's what's going on right now. And so this whole thing is being developed in the early church. And Paul and the apostles, they had to make all of this abundantly clear because it wasn't clear because they were actually on the stage writing the pages of scripture with their lives and the way God instructed them to carry out the gospel message of Jesus Christ. They were actually living letters, living epistles, writing out what we now call scripture. And Paul is telling the church at, in uh, Corinthian and Corinth that, which I've been there, beautiful place in Corinth, and he's telling them that you, um, the difference between tongues and prophecy, the difference in tongues and foreign languages, there is a tongue that speaks to God and then there God can give you a special gift to speak a language that's not your own. Now, there, those arguments go on to this day and there are people that will argue with you right now until the cows come home about that. I'm simply reading to you what the scriptures say so that you will say and follow up yourself like the noble Bereans they search these things daily to see whether or not they were so. But the church in Corinth also is a church coming out of all kinds of idolatry and witchcraft and demonology of various kinds. And so Paul, over two chapters, in chapter 12 of the same book of 1 Corinthians, speaks to them about the Spirit of God. And turn there with me, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray by mute idols. That no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be accursed. So in other words, if it's truly the Spirit of God, it would never say Jesus is cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The true conversion only happens because you believe that Jesus is Lord. You can't just say this in a secular way and somehow it happens. No, you have to believe this. It says though, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone is the same God at work. So in other words, God gives his spirit in different ways or different giftings to different people. It's the same spirit. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that lives in you is the same spirit that brings gifts. There is not a spirit that brings salvation and then another one that brings the gifts of the spirit when you become a believer the spirit of god is living on the inside of you and all of the gifts of the spirit are possible in you if god chooses to give them to you and also it says desire spiritual gifts so god bless you and continue to study like the noble Bereans and see whether these things are so. God bless you.